Um, our guest this afternoon is one of the most experienced, most knowledgeable national security specialists in Washington today. Maybe I should just stop at that, right? Um, that'd be fine, yeah. He's, um, and he's also proving to be a talented novelist. Um, Richard Clark had a long career first in the U.S. government where he served for 30 years, initially at the State Department and Pentagon, and then for 10 years on the NSC staff under both Bushes and Clinton, focusing on counterterrorism and cybersecurity issues. He had a reputation back then as, um, well, um, well, Dick, you wouldn't say you were exact, exactly the meek and mild type, right? He, um, he was known as a, as a hard charger, and one, of the main, and one of his main claims to fame was that he pushed hard and early to go after Osama bin Laden before the 9-11 attacks. When he left government in 2003, he wrote what became a bestseller against all, all enemies, criticizing the George W. Bush administration for not having taken sufficient action against the terrorist threat. Since then, Dick has taught at Harvard, managed a consulting firm, helped lead the Middle East Institute, worked as an ABC News consultant, and written several books, both fiction and nonfiction, at least some of which, um, I think as, as four of which, uh, right? Yeah, he's, he's, he's spoken uh, here at Politics and, and Prose for. Uh, his latest work, uh, Sting of the Drone, is his third novel, and like his other fiction, it reflects Dick's extensive familiarity with real-world national security operations. As he mentions in an, in an author's note at the end of the book, Dick himself bears some personal responsibility for the U.S. decision more than a decade ago to start using drones against terrorists. Months before 9-11, he pressed for predators to be deployed over Afghanistan to hunt for bin Laden, and then argued for arming the predators with Hellfire missiles to kill bin Laden. But the CIA and the Pentagon resisted until after the September 11th attacks. In the years since, U.S. drones have killed at least 2,000 people in five countries. Dick has said his first aim in writing a novel that uh, is centered on drones was to produce a thriller. And Sting of the Drone really is a page turner with lots of state-of-the-art technical detail. But the book also raises questions about the extent and risks of the current drone effort, which has become a much wider program than originally anticipated. In particular, the plot examines what could happen if one day killer drones were used by the bad guys against us. And there's already some, some basis to worry about this, as Dick will no doubt explain. If you're looking for a book that's both a riveting tale and an instructive, provocative discussion about unmanned aircraft, you should read Sting of the Drone. Please join me in welcoming Dick Clark. Thank you. That was very kind. Thank you all for showing up. You're, you're obviously my kind of people to show up uh, at a bookstore uh, on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. Uh, that's what I would do. I'm glad to see other people are doing it, too. Uh, as, as Bradley said, uh, my initial goal here uh, was to write um, a Tom Clancy-esque novel uh, and, and to actually have it uh, be truly fiction, not like some other authors who uh, take true stories and, and turn them into fiction. This is, this is completely fiction. None of the people are real and none of the people are anybody that you know because uh, they don't exist. But the goal was to write something that an audience separate from, frankly, separate from the kind of people who come here uh, would, would pick up and read. Because, you know, people who come here are just as likely to pick up the nonfiction as they are the fiction. I'd, I'd like to know someday what the breakdown is on, on sales here, but I bet it's pretty, pretty even. But nationwide, that's not true. And when people walk into uh, bookstores at airports, uh, they tend to go for the, the quick page turner, the thriller, the summer beach read. And my goal was to use that vehicle and, and legitimately produce a good book, because uh, I like reading those kinds of books, to l produce something that I would have liked to have read. But in the process of doing that, to get them to think about the issue of, of drones. Uh, or unmanned aerial vehicles, or whatever we're calling them these days. 
I think the best question I've had so far uh, in, the, in the book tour was from Jake Tapper uh, at CNN, who said, you know, Dick, I've known you for a long time. I've read the book, and I didn't know which side you were on. Were you for drones or against drones? Uh, and then last week I was in Los Angeles, and a reader said that he had read it. And he said, you know, I went into this book thinking the drones were a bad thing. And about halfway through, I was really confirmed in that belief. And then I read the next chapter and thought, wait a minute, these are good things. So at least with Jake Tapper and, and my reader in Los Angeles, I think, uh, at least with those two, I've succeeded in showing both sides of the issue. Uh, and hopefully not in a heavy-handed or pedantic way. But there are not just two sides, but lots of sides to this issue. And the best way, I thought, of conveying all of that uh, was to put it into uh, a, the arc of a novel uh, and to put the arguments uh, into the words and the actions uh, of the characters. Uh, and so one of the characters, uh, not to destroy the book for you if you haven't read it yet, but one of the characters, the lead, one of the lead characters is a woman who's a CIA, senior CIA officer, uh, who has been transferred from her previous assignments in uh, Baghdad and Kabul uh, to coordinate the drone strikes. Uh, and she has spent her life, at least the last 10 or 15 years of her life, trying to stop terrorist attacks. And she lives that and breathes that and feels that. She feels like she has the weight of the world on her shoulders, uh, and it's her personal responsibility to stop these terrorist attacks before they kill uh, more Americans or before they kill uh, innocent people who are not Americans, allies. And when she looks at the tools that she has to do that, the tools that work to do that, she doesn't have very many. And so she resorts over and over and over again to flying these drones and using them to kill terrorists. But in doing so, sometimes she and her Air Force pilots uh, make mistakes. And they make unintentional mistakes, and sometimes they bend the rules because there's a temptation. There's a temptation to do that. When she is feeling the weight of the world on her shoulders and feeling the need to stop these terrorist attacks, sometimes she has blinders on. And sometimes she doesn't see the larger context or what could be counterproductive activity. In the, uh, in the afterward, I do mention the fact that I think the current estimate, uh, the low end estimate, is the United States has killed 2,500 people with drones in five countries. Uh, that was certainly not the idea when we started out. When we started out, it was born of a frustration uh, that we couldn't find Osama bin Laden. Couldn't find him and fix him in a location long enough to fly in a team and arrest him. Or even to find him and fix him long enough that we could fire a cruise missile at him. And so we started flying these drones for the purpose of finding him. And we did. Uh, that was in October of the year 2000. We flew about 13 missions that year, uh, unarmed. There was no such thing as an armed predator at the time. Uh, and we found bin Laden on the third night. Very clear image, unbelievable image, to be sitting here in Washington and looking at a little TV screen and knowing that you are looking down live uh, into Afghanistan. And I knew that night we had crossed a Rubicon, that when that technology existed, that I could sit here and say, no, 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 over to the right, go that way. And somewhere on the other side of the world, an airplane without a person in it would turn a little bit to the right so I could get a better view. We started out with the program back then 
with the purpose of finding him. But even when we found him, the CIA and the military were unable to do anything with that information. They weren't able to get into Afghanistan in a timely way to catch him. And so we proposed arming the predator. Uh, and we had a very long and technical discussion of the pros and cons of doing that and the legality of doing that. Because we were afraid what we were doing was creating a kill list, uh, much as the Israelis had done 20 years earlier and still do. We wanted to avoid that because we thought that had turned out very badly for the Israelis. Uh, but at the same time, we knew that if we didn't do something to stop bin Laden uh, before he did something to us, we would regret it. Uh, and so we pushed through a program uh, in early 2001 in the new administration to arm the predator. We did in probably six months what normally would have taken six years of program development. And we ran tests against what looked like bin Laden's house, a little mock-up in Nevada. And then we pushed for a decision to deploy it. And CIA and the Pentagon both said no. And no one in the White House above me would support me to override them. And so the system was not deployed. In fact, a decision on September 4th, 2001, failed to come to an agreement. September 4th, 2001, in the Situation Room, the White House at the Cabinet level. A week later, 9-11 happened. The day after that, CIA and the Pentagon said they had this wonderful idea, we should arm the Predator. But the purpose of arming the Predator, the purpose of arming the Predator, was to go after a handful a handful of very senior terrorist leaders who we knew to be plotting further attacks against Americans and who we couldn't get in any other way. It was never to conduct a multi-year, multi-country campaign against anything that moved, which is more or less what happened. Not only did we develop a, a hit list that goes on for pages, but in the Bush administration and later in the Obama administration, the presidents authorized attacking camps and facilities that fit the signature of a place where an important person might be. So they didn't even know an important person was there they approved tax called signature tax if the camp looked like a terrorist camp where a senior Al-Qaeda person would hang out. And of course, because of that broadening of the scope of the mission, uh, even into doing close air support for the government of Yemen, even into doing close air support of NATO uh, in Libya, a lot of accidents occurred. And it's impossible to know how many innocent people uh, have been killed by drones? There are wildly different estimates. At one point, when John Brennan, now director of the CIA, uh, was working in the White House, he told a, a press conference he thought there had been no innocent people killed. That would seem to be improbable. Uh, estimates are in the hundreds by some organizations and in the thousands by others. Uh, I don't frankly know. I'm sure it's not in the thousands. But the fact is, whenever you kill somebody by mistake with a drone in Yemen or Pakistan or Afghanistan or Iraq or Libya or Somalia, all the countries we've done this in, they all have brothers and sisters and tribe. Uh, and tribe is very important uh, in all of those countries. And we know of instances in places like Iraq and Pakistan uh, and Afghanistan where people were not radicalized and were not really enemies of the United States and became radicalized and became enemies of the United States 
because drones attacked and killed members of their tribe or killed their sons or killed their fathers or just blew up part of their village. So the president last year announced at a speech at the War College that he was bringing the program back down to a smaller program and that he was establishing new rules to make it tougher uh, to get approval for a drone mission and to make it far less likely uh, that a drone mission would end up in, in a tragedy and be counterproductive. And among the things he said he was getting rid of were attacks on camps and facilities, the so-called signature strikes. That was last May. And even as recently as last December, however, the United States was conducting a mission in Yemen uh, and attacked something that turned out to be a wedding party uh, and killed large numbers of people who were not al-Qaeda uh, and who were not radicalized and who were not opposed to the United States. Uh, but needless to say, that village and that family, uh, that extended tribe, uh, now is. So we know of that specific case uh, in Yemen uh, as recently as last December. For a while, it looked like the United States, under the new rules, had stopped using drones in Pakistan. Uh, and then on Thursday, uh, we conducted two attacks in Pakistan that looked like they were done at the request of the Pakistani government. Uh, once again, using drones not the way the president said we were going to, only, his rule was, only to protect American lives and only if we had an imminent threat uh, of an attack. Instead, the attacks that were conducted this week in Pakistan look like uh, they were done at the request of the Pakistani army. So this novel tries to raise all of those issues. Uh, it tries to raise uh, the issues about drone strikes being counterproductive. Uh, it demonstrates how some, uh, someone who had their father killed by a drone uh, then spends the rest of his life trying to fight the drone program. And you see the drone program through his eyes, the young man whose father got killed by the drones, and he is bent on vengeance. And you see the drone program through the eyes of the CIA woman who's running the program. You see it through the eyes of the pilot who is not in Afghanistan, who is not in Pakistan or Saudi Arabia. The pilot is in Las Vegas. Uh, and that's true. Many of our pilots uh, are based in the United States, and the largest concentration of them uh, are in an Air Force base just outside of Las Vegas. And so they live this incongruous life where they're up at the opposite time of the day because their job is to fly during the daytime in Pakistan. And they're living in these darkened air-conditioned rooms uh, with video screens. And it looks nothing more than like a, uh, a video game convention. It looks like they're all playing video games. And they have to tell themselves over and over and over again that they aren't playing video games because they're young and they're, they're of a generation that grew up playing video games in which people died all the time. And now that's what they're doing. They're sitting at computer consoles that look a lot like the video games that they played as kids. Uh, and they may, day after day after day, fly missions that go nowhere or fly missions that just stare at a target trying to develop uh, the history of that target. But then there's the day when they're called upon to attack and kill somebody. And so they do that with a joystick and a button and 10,000 miles away in a place where they will never go, in a place where they have never been, people die. And then those young pilots get up when their shift is over and walk out into Las Vegas and drive their sports cars back home to their lovely ranch houses. It's a new way of war. 
And while it doesn't cause the kind of PTSD that fighting in Iraq uh, or Afghanistan did, it does cause a, a form of PTSD. Uh, and so the Air Force, both in the novel and in reality, the Air Force has assigned uh, psychologists and chaplains to work with these young pilots because of the, the cognitive dissonance they have uh, and the difficulty they have uh, about the fact that what looks like a game that they're playing uh, ends up killing people. And sometimes they make mistakes. And sometimes they know it. The United States government, when we make a mistake with a drone, uh, doesn't admit it for the most part. When a tank rolls over somebody by mistake in Iraq uh, or Afghanistan, an American tank, there is very shortly thereafter a team of Americans who arrive and apologize on behalf of the U.S. government. And in the Islamic tradition, it's acceptable to offer money as a way of apologizing. Uh, and so the United States did that a lot uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and it was at least understood, uh, if not appreciated. When we strike with a drone, we don't do that. We don't even admit we did it, because the program is a covert action program. And it kind of strains the basis of covert action to say that we have a covert action program that the president gives speeches about. <laughs> so it's covert action when we want it to be, and it's not when we don't want it to be. And we don't, when we make mistakes, go into these villages uh, or have our friends go into the villages on our behalf. Probably wouldn't be a wise idea for an American to show up in some of these places uh, and apologize and make reparations. We don't do that. Uh, and we don't when there are mistakes made, uh, ever make public the results of U.S. internal investigations. So when something like the wedding blows up in Yemen, we never find out who screwed up. How did that happen? Did the pilot make a mistake? Did the intelligence people make a mistake? Who made the mistake? And what have we done to make sure that never happens again? We never find out because it's covert action, except when we don't want it to be. Also in the novel, uh, there are some scenes that people have asked me, you know, isn't that a little crazy? Isn't that a little extreme? Didn't you go kind of overboard to make your point? And one of those scenes is in Las Vegas at the drone show. Uh, for those of you who've been downtown to the convention center for the car show, the auto show, or the boat show, uh, this is, in, in the novel, uh, something like that. Uh, it looks like the car show or the boat show. Uh, but it's a drone show, and various makers of drones from around the world uh, have their drones. The Chinese uh, have some on display. The Canadians have some on display. There are a whole bunch of Israeli drones on display. And people have said to me, you know, I was with you up to that point, but then you went kind of jumped the shark, uh, and that got a little silly. Well... That scene in the book actually happened when I went to the drone show in Las Vegas. Uh, uh, it was exactly the way I describe it in the book, and it happens every summer uh, at the convention center in Las Vegas. All of these countries make drones now. Uh, and they come to Las Vegas, ironically enough, every year to sell them. And what that indicates to me is we're not the only people who are going to play this game. There may be three countries and only three, I think, uh, up till now that have killed people with drones. Uh, but there are, I think, by last count, 46 countries that have armed drones. Uh, and probably over 20 countries who are making drones. And they make them in every shape and size. Uh, there's one that looks a lot like a hummingbird. It's about that big. Uh, and there's one that looks a lot like a 737 and is about the same size. And there's everything in between. And they're coming to a neighborhood near you. And we really don't know whether that's a good idea or not. We don't know what the rules are going to be. Uh, 
a couple of weeks ago in Florida, a drone that somebody was flying, some personal personal drone, uh, almost hit a, uh, an airliner as it was landing in Florida. It was almost a mid-air collision. Uh, that's going to happen. Uh, these drones that are being used in the United States by a variety of people uh, don't have collision avoidance devices, don't frequently show up on radar. Uh, who's using them? Police departments are using them. Uh, Homeland Security is using them. Farmers are using them to look at crop yields. Forest fire people are using them to find forest fires. The Coast Guard is using them to do search and rescue. Every week there's a new use. The, the newest use that I've seen in Washington is, given, given Washington, real estate agents. Yes, I'm not making that up either. Um, and so we do need to ask ourselves, uh, what, what do we want the rules to be on the use of lethal drones on behalf of our country? Uh, what do we think uh, when other people use lethal drones, when other countries use lethal drones? What will we say? Uh, how hypocritical will we be? Uh, and what do we think the rules should be about domestic use of drones? Turns out under current law, uh, while you're skinny dipping in the hot tub in your backyard, somebody can fly a drone overhead with a camera in it. Uh, and if you call the police and complain, that's not illegal. There's no law being violated there. Or perhaps if somebody flies that drone up, that personal drone that they bought for $2,000 on Amazon, flies it up and hovers outside your bedroom window with a camera, it's not clear that that's illegal either. So there's a whole new world uh, of drones out there that we have only just begun to enter. And my goal in writing the novel was to, was to get you all to think about that, uh, all of those issues, uh, while having perhaps a good time uh, wondering how the, how the suspense story uh, is going to end. And just one spoiler alert, it's kind of a surprise ending. <laughs> so let me stop there, uh, and I'll be glad to take any comments. If, if anybody has read it already, we'd love to get some feedback. And if you would, uh, if you don't mind, when you're commenting or asking a question, if you'd go to either this mic or that mic. And the reason for that is so everyone else can hear, but also because the store is uh, videotaping, and this is the only way your question will show up on the audio. Yes. Uh, hi, Dick. I've got two topics real quick for you. Uh, the first is, did you see Jeffrey Scahill's documentary, Dirty Wars? Mm -hmm. There's a very disturbing scene where they're showing a baby, they're, the film of a dead baby who's been killed by U.S. drone strike. Do, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I did see it. It is very disturbing. Uh, it, you don't know whether or not that baby actually was killed by a drone, but I'm sure we have I'm sure there have been drone strikes that have killed babies. Is it one? Is it 12? Is it 400? We don't know. And that's part of my problem with the lack of transparency in our drone program. Um, you know, we're told by the government, oh, don't worry about it. There have been very few accidents. Well, fine. You know, prove it. Don't, don't, don't make me believe the government. You know, show me the numbers. So that, that leads to my next question, which is, in Rachel Maddow's book, Drift, mm -hmm. she talks about uh, defense-type operations moving from the Department of Defense to the CIA, yep. where the CIA can't be brought before Congress and questioned, and that these covert actions are now outside of the public realm. Well, she does say that, and I, I generally agreed with what she said, but it, it's not true that the CIA can't be called before Congress and, and interrogated. What is true is that usually when that happens, uh, it's in a closed hearing. Uh, and so it speaks to this issue of transparency. Uh, all throughout our history, when CIA has done things like this, they've done it under the legal authority of the Intelligence Act, which, makes, which gives them one option, which is a covert action. Uh, and so, in, in part, it's the typical Washington tyranny of the lawyers. Uh, 
the only legal way they have at the moment to do things is if they do them as covert actions. And then, once it's a covert action, they can't tell anybody about it, uh, which turns out to be self-defeating uh, in this case. So it would be nice if we could, as the president said he would over a year ago, uh, increase the transparency on the program. Um, and perhaps even have an outside group uh, of people that the public would trust uh, look at the program and see if they believe the numbers and believe the story. Uh, but we haven't had that. Thank you. Yes, sir. National security is alive and well in Hollywood right now with the success of Homeland and the Americans. Do you find yourself indulging in those depictions? And would you approve <laughs> your latest work being converted into the big screen or small screen? Are you offering? <laughs> <laughs> um, we were talking before the uh, before the uh, event tonight, and apparently, twenty four the TV show is back and is about drones. I've never seen twenty four, uh, not the new one or the old one. Uh, so I, I I don't watch a lot of these uh, national security depictions uh, on TV or in the movies because every time I do, I get pained. And it's just the inaccuracies are so much that uh, it's kind of a busman's holiday anyway. So um, I haven't seen, in many years seen a movie that depicted any of this stuff uh, accurately. Uh, but there's, there's a challenge. They, they could take my book and, uh, and, and do it fairly accurate. I'd be fine with that. Uh, thanks very much for a sobering review. Um, well, I'm curious about the decision-making process for a strike. Mm -hmm. You have, obviously, drones flying over whatever country it may be. You have the host government permitting them to be there. You have the agency uh, uh, with its control mechanism and its authority to have the drone up. And then you have this poor individual, a pilot, sitting in Las Vegas with a deal to pull the trigger. Right. And do you ever, I mean, is there a kind of a, a two-part, like in, in intercontinental ballistic missiles, is there ever a two-part kind of decision-making or oh, even it's, a three-part? It's, it's much more than two parts or three parts. It's, mm -hmm. it's multi-layered. Uh, in the second chapter of the book, um, the second chapter of the book is largely the dialogue of something called the Kill Committee, mm -hmm. uh, which people have asked me, is the Kill Committee, does it really exist? Yeah. Only they don't call it the kill committee, um, for obvious reasons. But what, what happens in the second chapter of the book is that uh, there's a meeting in the White House where various representatives of various agencies sit around uh, and nominate people to be killed. Uh, and everybody has their folder of the nominations. And it's a bit like if you've ever been in a promotion board meeting or an admissions board meeting. At a, at a college or a school, you know, you've got the folder with the picture and the description and the justification and all that, and they go through the folders and decide who they're going to kill. Uh, and it, I hope chapter two makes it come to life in many ways, but one of the ways I hope it comes to, to life is how mundane it had become, how routinized it had become. You know, when, when, I was in meetings at the White House dealing with this issue at the beginning of the program. It was a rare thing for us to contemplate that we might use lethal force against somebody. But as you see in Chapter 2, it's kind of normal and routine. And it's another, you know, oh, it's Tuesday. I must go to the kill committee. Mm -hmm. um, what they do is to see if these, these high-level Al-Qaeda people or high-level al-Qaeda-related people, uh, fit the criteria that has been laid out. And lots of lawyers debate this and discuss it, and they either approve it or they don't. And Once he's approved, once that person has been approved for being hit, then whenever the guy who's flying the drone and the other intelligence people supporting him think they've found somebody on that list then they can act. But even then, they have to go through a multiple layer approval. Uh, yeah. uh, and, you know, the guy at the end of the day who pushes the button has very limited authority. Um, and it's really, even then, in real time, 
it's the result of a lot of people looking at the same screen, people in different places around Washington, looking at that same screen and saying, do I really believe this is the guy? Am I really sure that if we hit him, we won't hit anybody else uh, who's innocent? Have we looked at this place long enough to know there are no children in the, in the building next door uh, or, that, or there's not a hospital across the street or all of those sorts of things? Uh, and then and only then will they authorize the attack. Now, many times that means they've got the person in sight who they want to have, who they've been looking at for months, looking to try to get for months, and they won't fire because somebody else is in, in the area. Yeah. Uh, and they will look for hours to get what they call a pattern of life to make sure that there's nothing else around. Mm -hmm. So they have all the rules. It just doesn't seem to work sometimes. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. Um, I've been reading a lot about uh, Harry Truman and his decision, along with uh, Secretary of State James Burns, mm -hmm. to drop the atomic bombs on Japan. And uh, clearly from the memos and the, the memoirs and everything, the, the two of them were really almost narcoticized. Uh, they were, were so in love with this amazing power that, that they and only they had. Truman and Byrne? Truman and Burns. Yeah. And uh, would they use it? Well, of course they were going to use it. You know, they, were, they were just these powerful people, and this was going to be for the good. Yeah. And as you're talking about this whole process, this feels very similar. Uh, certainly the, the, the we seem to act as if we have a monopoly on this, and, on this technology, and you're saying that we don't really and that uh, I was wondering if you, if, you know, if your next book would be about when all of a sudden somebody buys one of these things and uh, paints it with Amazon colors and, and drops off not an Amazon thing but a bomb somewhere. Well, that might actually happen in this book. Oh, oh so, so, sorry. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think there is an addictive quality to that use of force. Mm -hmm. Remember what I said at the beginning about that CIA woman who feels the weight of the world on her shoulders and it's her personal job to stop Americans from being killed and she looks into her quiver to see what arrow she has and she's got one, you know, that works. Or she thinks works. And it, there is a seduction, an addiction and a seduction that occurs with the drones because at one level, they look really cool, right? The, let's say the thing is shot down, which seldom happens. But let's say the thing is shot down. The pilot goes home to her husband. There's no risk. You know, she gets in her car and drives down the street to her lovely you know, ranch home in, in Henderson, Nevada, and the next day they'll give her another one. You know, so there is this, and it did work, at least initially, uh, and seemed to have very little blowback, at least initially. So there is this seduction that occurs and an addiction that occurs. And, it, and like any other seduction and addiction, if you cut it off, you know, what else is there? If you cut off the U.S. drone program, what do they have that really works in these strange places where they can't get to in any other way. Uh, and many of these places are kind of beyond the realm. People say to me, well, we were able to drop a, a SEAL team in to Abbottabad to get, you know, bin Laden. Why can't we do that instead of these drone programs? Well, you'd be doing it a lot. Uh, and it's highly risky. And the, the, this, this, uh, the addiction here is to doing it in a way where there's no risk to Americans. No immediate risk, to the pilot at least. <clears throat> Sir. Thanks, really fascinating remarks. Um, first, I just couldn't help being reminded of the Milgram experiments by your, uh, by your comments. It sounds like the drone program is really just a reenactment of those very troubling experiments. Which experiments? The Milgram experiments where, where uh, where subjects are basically told that it's okay to Oh, yeah, shock. yeah, the Yale study. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then they just get so used yeah. to it, and the shocks get going right. higher and higher. Um, but I, I wanted to come back to uh, your response to the gentleman that was at this mic just before me. 
uh, because it seemed to me there was a little bit of a tension between your response to his question, which that response painted a, a picture of a fairly narrow, cautious, painstaking process. Um, when your main remark suggested that you know wedding parties are being blown up, this is becoming routinized. Uh, so I just wanted to sort of pin you down a little bit, if I could, and ask you, uh, to the degree that Obama put in these new precautions in May of 2013, uh, I mean, do they seem, obviously there was this wedding party that came after it. Uh, we don't know whether this was an outlier, mm -hmm. but do, 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 do you sense that the process that is now in place would be effective at preventing widespread mistakes if it were actually implemented? Or would, do you have them go further, and if so, how? There have been very uh, f much fewer attacks in the last year. Um, I, I couldn't give you the numbers off the top of my head, but it's a significant reduction in the number of attacks since the new rules went into effect. Um, but the new rules still leave us with a covert action program. Uh, and when something goes wrong under the new rules, like the wedding in, in Yemen, we still don't know why. Uh, and we still don't have any sort of U.S. government official statements about what happened, what we did to make retribution. Um, who we were going after in the first place, uh, how many innocent people were killed. Uh, we get that from blogs. We don't get it from the government. Uh, so, yeah, there, in, in the earlier period, when we, we had 50 drones up at a time at one point, uh, when we were in both Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, they still, even then, they had all those rules and all those lawyers uh, and the multi layers, uh, but there were still problems. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, thanks for being here. In the last year or so, there's been a lot of uh, uh, news reports in the press that the administration has been thinking about uh, moving the drone or targeted killing programs from the CIA mm -hmm. to either JSOC or the Air Force or the military. Right. I'm wondering where you stand in that debate and kind of going back to some of these questions in terms of, you know, what are the if there's any difference in terms of transparency, compliance mechanisms, different types of... of uh, yeah, so when the president gave that speech a year ago, May, and talked about stepping down from a war footing, one of the things that either he said or the White House background did, I forget which it was, was that they wanted to transfer all of the drone operations from um, to the Defense Department. Right now, they're both the Defense Department and CIA have programs. It depends upon where the program, where the target is. Uh, which, which program is used. But they, they did say over a year ago that they wanted to transfer uh, the CIA program over to, to DOD. That has not been done uh, for a variety of reasons, many of them bureaucratic, some of them congressional. Um, but if they did, you could end the, the covert action part of it. Uh, and that would allow for greater transparency. I mean, that would remove the legal barrier. That's one way to remove the legal barrier. There are other ways that they can remove. People, you know, the, the, the fun thing to me in watching lawyers wrap themselves around uh, axles in the, in the government is they all act as though laws came down, you know, with Moses. Uh, and that all laws, you know, have been written by the finger of God in stone. You know, rather than saying, what do we want the policy to be? What makes sense? Uh, and if we have to change the law, we'll change the law. Uh, all too often what we see in, in the executive branch is uh, executive branch lawyers saying, oh, you have to do it this way because of the law, whether or not it makes any sense. I'm not a lawyer, in case you hadn't guessed. Right. I just remind you about how they wanted to torture and found a way to do that with an opinion. But um, Oh, they, they wanted to do the, the Section 215 you know, telephony metadata program. And, and did by saying Section 215 of the Patriot Act authorized it. And it doesn't. Right. There's nothing in the Section 215 that authorizes it. Well, so, yeah, I, they, they can stretch laws. They have. Right. I uh, appreciate your candor on all of these matters. Um, you know, I, I read Blowback and I read Legacy of Ashes, and one thing that I think is it's all very well to have this file folder, but if it's complete junk, then it doesn't do anybody in the decision-making process right. any good. Right. So until we can get 
the um, secrecy off this and be able to really look at what's being done. We don't know how much blowback there's going to be to the United States. That's right. And you know, if, if you read Legacy of Ashes, which is a great, great book, uh, it's, it's sort of a 50-year history of the CIA. And I think there are 200 pages of footnotes. Uh, so it's not the author's opinion. Uh, it's, it's year after year after year of congressional hearings, inspector general reports, outside audits of various kinds, all of which conclude over and over and over and over and over again that the CIA in every era made massive mistakes. Um, so yeah, when CIA walks into a room with a folder and says, this guy is a bad guy because... You do need to ask, where are the sources for that? Uh, has, there, has anybody really vetted that? Or is this one, one thread uh, providing information? Or is it like so many of the people who got picked up and sent to Guantanamo at the beginning, people who had done nothing wrong, who were just finked out by somebody who didn't like them uh, in order to get money? Uh, yeah, those, th those things happen. Uh, and so what looks like a very, you know, nice official intelligence report that's got a big red stamp on the top that says top secret and has some funny name on it, you know, a lot of people just say, well, boy, if it's on CIA letterhead and it's got top secret funny name, you know, it must be true. And just by putting top secret funny name on top of something doesn't make it true. Thank you all uh, for coming. Yeah, one last question. Um, owner's prerogative. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what's already known about the bad guys who have been targeted by U.S. drones uh, thinking and uh, trying to find ways to turn the drones back on us? Yeah. Um, so the, the, a lot of that happens in the book. Um, but what I, I guess what I can say in the real world there was a good article in the Washington Post about nine months ago uh, that talked about the various ways in which the people who are being targeted by drones are trying to figure out how to deal with the drones. And they've kind of figured out a few things. They figured out that uh, if they're surrounded by women and children, they're not going to be hit, for the most part. Um, that um, if they're in vehicles in a crowded area, they're probably not going to be hit like a marketplace. Uh, they may also have figured out ways of uh, shooting down drones uh, because, after all, they're little airplanes, uh, and airplanes can be shot down. Uh, they're not invisible. Uh, they're not particularly fast. Uh, and Actually, they're relatively easy targets. Um, the Iranians claim uh, that they jammed the signals going to a drone uh, and redirected it and caused it to land uh, in Iran. Uh, and CIA and the Pentagon say that's impossible. On the other hand, the Iranians have the drone. Um, <laughs> and there's an incident in the novel where something like that happens, uh, and the novel goes into detail technically about how you could do it. Uh, so I think it could be done. Um, so yeah, there are definitely countermeasures uh, that uh, people are taking against drones. You know, again, as the, as the gentleman said in the question, we were arrogant to think that we are the only ones who are ever going to be able to do this, uh, or arrogant to think that we were going after you know stupid people who live in caves. Uh, they're not stupid, and they don't live in caves. Thanks very much. <laughs>